Eight of seven brooks. Can you send me border patrol? There's people in the back with a tarp. This is an NCIC operator calling from Coastal Bend Inmate Facility with a prepaid call and call sign. Please state your name and location. Tell me why you are in jail, basically. Uh, human smuggling. What's more profitable to, you know, drug smuggling or people smuggling? What's your take on that? Right now, the money's in the people. It's in the millions, if not billions, of dollars annually. There's uh, major money in smuggling uh, human cargo across the border. Mommy, no, no me tomes. Ella es tranquila. Ella es platica mucho. Ella es juguetona. Ella iba a la escuela, al kinder, a la iglesia. Ella tenía sus amiguitos para jugar. Desde que nació, ella, como le digo, es hija única. Y, y pues aquí, todo lo que nosotros está a nuestro alcance, todo se lo dábamos. O sea, el problema de nosotros es que somos pobres. Like so many other immigration stories, this one is about money. But poverty is only half the picture. The desperation of Haley's family feeds a giant money-making machine that seems to benefit everyone except maybe migrants themselves. I'm Jay Root, a reporter for the Texas Tribune. To follow this money trail, I began in what's called the Wild East of Honduras. Pues, al principio, cuando uno es pequeño, pues, todo es alegría, pero va viviendo cada día más, se va dando cuenta de de lo que pasa en el país, las pobrezas, el peligro que corre uno con el crimen organizado, la venta de drogas. Partes de aquí en Honduras que ya no se pueden ni meter a algunas colonias, ya no puede entrar. Aquí es difícil la vida, sí. Por eso la mayoría de la gente se, se, se va para otros países, emigra. ¿Desde cuándo estabas pensando en irte? Ya, ya tiempitos, sí. Eh, por lo menos unos dos años o año y medio. Eh, los recursos económicos son, son muy bajos, no hay manera de, de viajar. Uh -huh. Es muy poca la probabilidad de viajar uh -huh. por la pobreza. Carlos has asked us not to use his real name or show his face for fear of retribution from immigration authorities. Primero hay que buscar un, un coyote, siete mil dólares, y lo traen hasta la frontera a uno. Aquí en Honduras les dicen coyotes. Uno sirve como de guía para poder llevar a la gente para allá, para Estados Unidos, ¿me entiendes? Para allá hay varios viajes. Que hay unos que cuestan más baratos, hay otros que cuestan más o más, más caritos y está otro que es más caro, ¿me entiendes? Cuesta menos el viaje para un menor. Ellos dicen que sí es mejor con, con un niño y una niña. Pues claro, yo la traje pues por buscar el futuro a ella, ¿verdad? O sea, si se fuera ido él solo, tenía que pasar muchos obstáculos. Principalmente esconderse de migración. Bringing Haley makes it cheaper because Carlos doesn't need to be smuggled into the U.S. interior. Parents with kids are told by the coyotes to find a border patrol agent and ask for asylum. And so, just like that, six-year-old Haley is caught up in the border hustle. Cayó el día que 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 le dijeron si tienes el pisto mañana te llevo. Y esa fue la oportunidad de él de irse. Pues la niña no sabía, yo solo le dije que, que nos íbamos a ir para donde su tía. Y ella feliz. Ella iba de viaje. Ella iba con una felicidad. Se despidió de, su, de sus abuelos, de aquí, de las familias. Mí, conmigo se despidió y se fue. La madrugada se fue del día martes. Salimos en toda la noche hasta que llegamos a la frontera de Guatemala, a México. A técnica que ya entramos a México y sí estuvimos una noche. In La Tecnica, migration isn't just a part of the economy. Migration is the economy. I asked Stephanie Loiter, a university researcher who is an expert in migrant smuggling, to help explain the role that this tiny pirate town plays in the human smuggling trade. 
La Tecnica is one of the big jumping off points for migrants who are passing through Guatemala, mostly from Honduras, en route to Mexico. You're not going to be able to find it on many maps. It doesn't even show up. This is a one industry town. Uh, everyone here is involved. Everyone here seems to be making some money from it, whether it's feeding them, whether it's driving the boats, whether it's driving the taxis, uh, providing the hotels. It's an industry, it's a town that has sprung up around transit migration from Honduras. They get on these small boats, these small wooden boats, and there they cross over and get into taxis that are waiting for them on the other side, and then they'll head north. The next big stop on the migrant route is Villa Hermosa. This is where the coyotes start to make bang for their buck, because they can smuggle people in bulk. Right now, we are arriving to Villa Hermosa, which is one of the biggest hubs for migrant smuggling via tractor trailers in Mexico. The migrants are, are going to be boarding now into tractor trailers and moving north through Mexico on federal highways just like this one. It's difficult because there are many people here and you have to come very tight, you don't have to move. The majority of the time, the children are asleep, but they come with something, they always give them the air. They're paying a large chunk of money and they'll have to stay in this cramped space, 30, 40, 50, sometimes up to 80 and 100 people in one trailer where they'll be shipped north like cargo, um, like any other product. The last stop before the U.S., Reynosa, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And it's where a crime syndicate called the Gulf Cartel decides who gets to cross and who doesn't. Todo está cuidado por los cárteles. Como ya no hay mucho auge de de drogas ni nada de eso, ya el negocio también de ellos es pues es la gente. Les da más rentabilidad, les da dinero fácil, rápido. Ellos piden el número de los familiares de uno para luego llamarlos y decirles que tienen que depositar el dinero. Solo nos dicen que entre más pronto los paguen, más pronto salimos de ahí. The problem was Carlos and Haley didn't have any more money. Si uno no no paga ahí y lo agarran, se lo chingan, lo molestan, bien le dan piso o le sacan más dinero a los familiares. Le dije yo, no te preocupes, le dije yo que aquí lo vamos a buscar, le digo, vamos a ver. Los desvelamos una noche, dos noches. Pensando cómo íbamos a hacer. Yo vendí los, los televisores que tenía y un buen teléfono que tenía. No era para la cantidad de, de que se necesitaba, por eso tuvo que hacer eso el señor de empeñar su casa. After three days, the family wired $3,000 to Reynosa and the cartel finally let Carlos and Haley cross in a raft like this one. Luego nos llevaron a la orilla del río. Y, y ahí pues hasta nos tomaron unas fotos cuando estábamos en la, en la lancha ya para cruzarnos para que le dieran la orden a ellos de, de cruzarnos sí o no o si habían o si habían pagado el coyote la cuota el mismo coyote o, o la persona encargada de cruzarlos a ellos mandó un video Claudia lost the video of Carlos and Haley crossing but it was similar to this one that a smuggler recorded of another migrant family y ahí se miraba donde iba la niña con él en una balsa pequeña donde iban como siete ocho personas donde se iba cruzando el río y llegaban a un lugar donde había un, muchos árboles y de ahí cortó se cortaba el video yo un poco me sentía alegre porque digo yo ya ya va a caer a migración ya va fácil rápido va a salir más fácil pero no 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 fue así if you are smuggling a child, then we will prosecute you. And that child may be separated from you as required by law. This zero tolerance policy at the southern border has already separated thousands of children from their parents. When they took me to the court, I told them that I couldn't leave the child there. They told me that I couldn't take the child to the court. Otro me dijo que la niña no podía estar con criminales. Yo pensé que no iba a volver a ver a mi hija. After crossing the border and turning themselves into immigration, Carlos was taken to a detention facility north of Houston, and Haley was taken to a shelter 1,200 miles away in Phoenix, where no one could call her. Me, me llamó porque me llamaron de ahí el lugar donde estaba porque ella estaba llorando todas las noches. 
No llores. Yo nunca me imagino. Yo sé, muy. Yo sé, pero mire que ya falta poquito tiempo. Mire que se le van a poner los ojitos hinchados. Yo acá la estoy esperando, Moy. Yo no me imaginé que, que eso le iba a pasar a ella. Que iba a sufrir tanto. Yo nunca me imaginé que mi niña iba a sufrir de esa manera. Si yo hubiera tenido conocimiento de que mi hija iba a sufrir así, jamás en mi vida la hubiera dejado que se fuera. Nunca. I started this project to trace Carlos and Haley's journey to the U.S. From the very beginning, it was clear they were caught up in one big shakedown, from the gangs at home to the coyotes and the cartels on the road. I thought once they reached America, the shakedown would end. But on the other side of the border, our side of the border, it's just a different kind of hustle. The migrant crisis at the southern U.S. border is attracting private companies that can rake in money for running detention centers. Under my administration, anyone who illegally crosses the border will be detained. We fund that. We increase the amount of money for detention facilities. Pues ahí lo que yo escuchaba eh, a los demás personas que estaban ahí, que es que eh, decían que entre más tiempo nos tenían a nosotros ahí, a ellos les convenía porque ellos recibían un dinero por cada inmigrante. Entonces, por eso lo tenían a uno bastante tiempo ahí. Entonces, ellos lo usan como un negocio. The goal of operating a private prison is to make money. It is not to ensure public safety. It is not to rehabilitate prisoners. Um, it is not to provide a public service. It is to make money. So there are over 200 facilities around the country that hold people on a relatively long-term basis. Um, about 75% of people who are in custody under immigration laws will be in facilities that are owned and operated by private um, contractors. That's the Adelanto uh, Detention Center, or I call it prison. This is Carlos Hidalgo, a Salvadoran migrant who came to the U.S. as a child but was detained as an adult here for more than a year. If it weren't for us, these places wouldn't exist. They're making millions of dollars off of us. So the intersection between immigration detention and uh, private prisons is, um, is over three decades old. The two largest private prison firms are Core Civic, which was formerly known as CCA, and then also GEO. The numbers of people in immigration custody have really skyrocketed under the Trump administration. It was about 33,000 um, under the Obama administration, and it's now gone up to 44,000 people on any given night who are going to sleep in a, a facility that is holding them under immigration laws. Private prisons. They are cashing in on President Trump's get tough policies at the border. Since President Trump's election, share prices for GEO have shot up 25%, while Core Civic stock is 12% higher. Private prisons are not new, but Trump's crackdown on the border has given a big boost to the industry. And GEO and Core Civic even gave a half a million dollars to Trump's inaugural committee. Hi, Donald John Trump. The companies tend to focus most of their uh, campaign contributions and lobbying on Republican lawmakers, but not exclusively. So they certainly give to both parties. And currently, ICE contracts with private prisons are some of the, the largest revenue generators for private prison companies for both Core Civic and GEO Group. In fact, 2017 data shows ICE has become GEO and Core Civic's biggest customer, providing them about a billion dollars a year in revenue. And if I told you that immigration jails are less effective than, say, the family case management system in ensuring that people show up for their hearings and that they cost about $4 a day, whereas immigration prisons cost between 164 and as much as 375 bucks a day. This is the $200 toilet seat that everybody hates. This is government waste, fraud, and abuse. This is an economic argument. But it's not just costly for American taxpayers. The private prison system also squeezes money out of migrants like Carlos in detention. So one of the most shocking things to me about representing people in ICE prisons was the pricing models of these facilities. Whether it was phone rates and the exorbitant amount of money one has to spend in order to contact a lawyer or a loved one, whether it's the basic necessities that you need because there's a systemic underprovision 
of food and other daily needs. Um, those prices are significantly higher. The only way that many of these migrants would be able to pay for all of this is if they had a job. But undocumented migrants can't be employed, can they? Right, well, um, just like there are undocumented immigrants who are being coerced and treated poorly in the fields and in the hotel industry and in the food sector, there are also undocumented immigrants who are working for the private prisons. And one could say that GEO and CoreCivic are the largest employer of unauthorized labor in the country. They only pay you one dollar a day for an eight hours work. Now, you talk about getting up at four in the morning, serving all the detainees of this facility, cleaning up all the mess for the morning, and doing the same thing all over again to prep for lunch for one dollar. One dollar. Now, GEO and CoreCivic are facing multiple lawsuits from detainees who say they were illegally forced to work for little or no pay. Andrew Free is one of the lawyers suing the companies. Immigration detention is civil. It is not punishment for a crime. It is not subject to the 13th Amendment's uh, exception on the prohibition on involuntary servitude and forced labor. So in theory, uh, immigrant detainees cannot be forced to work. They're civil detainees, just like people who are being held in jail pending trial but have not yet been convicted. But you can provide certain incentives for them to work, um, and those incentives may be basically equivalent to uh, intimidation or forced labor. You know, private prison companies have to provide most or all of the services provided by public prisons or detention centers. So any time that they can reduce labor expenses, for example, by having detainees do work that otherwise they would have to pay for, uh, that's simply part of their business model of how they generate profit. Well, according to GEO, without having these um, dollar a day wages or forced labor programs, they've claim they would no longer be able to have these contracts with ICE. I mean, they've said that in several filings. Look, some people may think that I'm exaggerating when I say that extortion is being done by companies like this in comparison to what happens in places like my country, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, being exploited, being extorted. There's not much difference. The only difference is these people get to wear uniform when they do it. GEO told me in a written statement that it treats all its detainees humanely and that comparing the care they provide to extortion in Central America is, quote, the height of irresponsible, politically charged rhetoric, and it's inconceivable that a respected publication like Time would allow such reckless, over-the-top allegations to be aired unquestioned. Both companies say they play no role in creating immigration laws or in determining how long detainees are locked up. And Core Civic sent me a written statement saying, quote, all work programs at our ICE detention facilities are completely voluntary and operated in full compliance with ICE standards. In several of these cases, we have laid out allegations for why any choice to work, whether it's under the threat of solitary confinement or whether it's out of the necessity to have money to buy toilet paper, is not truly a free choice. GEO says even if it comes down to choosing between punishment or work, that's still a choice. Listen to this exchange between GEO's lawyer and a judge who questions the company's rationale. Disciplinary segregation can be used as a sanction for the refusal to work. They make a decision each time whether they're going to consent to work uh, or not. Or, or, and or eat uh, or be put in isolation, right? I mean... It, 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 yeah, it's, I mean, slaves had a choice, right? Private prisons aren't the only ones cashing in on migrants. Shelters that house kids get about $250 a day for each migrant child in their custody. The Trump crackdown that led to thousands of migrant children being separated from their parents is making some people rich. The New York Times is calling out an Austin-based charity for allegedly making millions off migrant children. I want to follow the money here. Sure. I had the chance to interview Juan Sanchez, the CEO of Southwest Key, the shelter where Haley stayed. Family of a little girl named Haley. Sanchez had already come under fire for his $1.5 million salary. 
I wanted to find out if there was any other way he was profiting from his nonprofit business. No, no, no. You, and you don't have any, any, any financial stake in any LLCs or anything like that that Southwest Key is doing business with or, ha or leases mm. from or anything like that? Okay. No, no. But after this interview, a Southwest Key representative told me Mr. Sanchez misunderstood the question. He did partly own one of the properties that his nonprofit leased from. Haley spent nearly eight weeks in Southwest Key. It took a federal court ruling in California to reunite her with Carlos. A federal judge has ordered the Trump administration to reunite immigrant children separated from their families at the border within 30 days. <laughs> Carlos and Haley were met in Los Angeles by his sister, who hadn't seen her family since she left Honduras more than a decade ago. ¿Qué calor hace? Haley is now going to school, learning English, and getting to know her long-lost cousins. Home. We are going home. We have to go home. Though he still doesn't have work papers, Carlos got a job and has begun to send money back home. But getting this new life has come at a high price. Tiene <laughs> temor ella. Eh, siempre quiere estar cerca de mí porque ella ya tiene ese temor ya por lo que nos sucedió. Pues ella ya tiene eso ya en su mente ya pendiente sí. y le da temor, mucho temor. Está tu tablet, mira. Le vamos a bajar unos jueguitos. Vamos a bajar unos jueguitos. Vaya, muy. Months after their journey, a cloud of uncertainty still hangs over Carlos and Haley. The pair have an attorney and almost any outcome is possible in their case. <laughs> but whether it's deportation, an extended stay in the U.S., or even another painful separation if one of them gets sent home, the family remains torn apart and deeply in debt from the high cost of being smuggled north. Ahora miro los niños que van a la escuela, los niños que van a la iglesia, y me hace falta. Porque yo siempre iba a la iglesia y tenía a mi niña y la sentaba al par mío. Y ahora ya, ya me siento yo sola. O sea, todo es diferente. Todo cambia. Todo cambia cuando, cuando hay una separación de esta manera. Todo. ¿Tú crees que irías así como emigrante? No sé. Se me hace muy difícil. Yo soy muy temerosa de lo que pueda suceder en el camino. Y la ansiedad de estar con mi hija me, me dice que sí. Pero el temor de que me pueda pasar algo y que mi hija se quede sin mí, no, no quisiera. Está bueno, no se preocupe, que yo aquí la, la quiero, yo aquí la voy a esperar y que cuando se venga algún día. Uh -huh. No sé si hay algo que quieres agregar o que no te he preguntado. No, pues no. Que no se vayan con ese sueño estúpido de los Estados Unidos, la neta. Es tu peor error. Porque ¿Qué, ¿Qué sueño? El sueño americano. Es una gran mentira. Según tú vas por, por un modo de vida bueno, y lo que vas a hacer allá es ser un esclavo. Yo nunca lo haría.